tomorrow. But today we do have a very special uh, presentation. One of the things that we have, I say we as in me, myself, um, I have come to appreciate the different trips that Steve and Arlene have taken. And then Steve has in, in turn shared a virtual tour of those trips. So today's presentation by Steve Meyer is specifically called and titled From Mongolia to Moscow. And this is a trip that he took on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Uh, it, it, it ended in Moscow, it went through many cities, and that is what Steve will be presenting today in pictures that he himself took. So I'm going to pass off the mic and the uh, presentation to Steve. And I wanted to uh, thank you again, Steve, for doing this for us. Okay, it's my pleasure, Levy, and thank you for the introduction. I like to uh, welcome my family members and friends who have shown up, especially my sister and brother-in-law who were on the trip with Bonnie and, and myself. And perfect to switch to that app. Yeah, exactly. On the to the left of it. So Steve, I think uh, to the left of your Zoom on the bottom taskbar is the program that you used. There you go. Try that. I'm, I'm not into- uh, The left of that, move one more over left. So I'm going to say Zoom. Join okay, no, the one underneath it, this little box in between, left of Zoom icon. That one, click on that. That's not it. Oh, that's not okay. So then you got to open it again. So just go back to your desktop. Uh, bear with us. This is just the uh, technical part of getting the presentation up. I think you'll have to reopen the program. Reopen the PowerPoint. Oh, there you go. Yeah, perfect. Okay. There you go. All right, show up okay? Yes. All right. Uh, in August, 2017, my wife and I accompanied by my sister and brother-in-law and two other ladies began our journey to Mongolia and Russia with Aeroflight flights from Los Angeles to Moscow, from Moscow, and from, from Moscow to Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia a total of 19 hours in the air. And this um, is the Trans-Siberian Railroad route. Uh, you could start it actually in Vladivostok, Russia, but we uh, chose to pick it up in uh, Mongolia. So if you started in uh, Vladivostok, you would go through China and then get to Mongolia. We started at the capital there, Ulaanbaatar, went into Siberia with stops at Irkutsk and Ekaterinburg and then into Kazan, which is out of Siberia and then into Moscow. This is the Mongolian flag. Originally a nomadic Buddhist center, this is Ulaanbaatar now, it became a permanent site in the 18th century Soviet control in the 20th century led to a religious purge. Soviet era buildings, museums with the surviving monasteries and a vibrant conjunction of traditional and 21st century lifestyles typify the modern city. This is a panoramic view and um, I didn't know what to expect but it's quite a cosmopolitan place and civilized. After we checked into our hotel, we were free for the rest of the day to walk around Ulaanbaatar. So these are some of the sites that we saw. Modern office buildings. This is the hotel we stayed at. Hotel on the left. This was the restaurant over here. And I guess this guy is a Genghis Khan who was all over the place. This is the opera house. More office buildings. This is the parliament building. 
Uh, this is in front of the, in the, this is in the plaza in front of the parliament building. And this is the steps of the parliament building. Uh, a lot of the natives get dressed in traditional costumes and have their pictures taken on the steps. And there's Genghis Khan again. This was a park overlooking the city. The next day we traveled to the Gorky Terelji National Park, where we visited a, stake, a sacred stone heap obu, which is used as a shrine in Mongolian folk religious practice. So this is uh, the entrance to the park. This is the obu. It's a herd of uh, something, I don't know, they're not cows, that's all I know. These are uh, sheep. <clears throat> this is turtle rock. And this is the Ariabel Monastery, which we visited. This is the Buddhist monastery. And the next stop was the uh, Burdit gear camp where we spent the night. So this, this is a, a yurt or a gear. Um, I have a picture of the inside. The, the problem was that the entrance had to face in a certain direction, I guess, to the east. And that was on the downhill side slope. So it was difficult to navigate these steps in the middle of the night looking for the uh, bathroom. This is the inside of the gear. Uh, we each had a cot to sleep on. This was the stove to keep the place warm. And the walls were well insulated so that we didn't suffer at all. This is some of the views of the camp, beautiful scenery. This was the uh, dining hall. This is where the staff lived. And somewhere in the mix, uh, maybe that building was the, uh, where the bathrooms and the showers were. Fortunately, there were not very many people staying there. In the morning was very misty. So this is a view of that. Uh, the next day, we visited a nomadic family that lived in the park. Um, one of the features of national parks in Mongolia is that the nomads can move around to graze their, er their herds as needed. And this particular family kept a herd of horses, and they earned their livelihood from selling mare's milk. Uh, this is the lady of the house. Uh, that's Arlene. This is our guide who was our translator. And the lady served us all kinds of treats uh, made from mare's milk, which I pretended to sample, but I wasn't brave enough to try drinking or eating any of it. This woman is very talented. She made all her clothing. This is the uh, way she did her cooking. The family slept on beds on the side. And they had a lot of uh, traditional art there, which was very nice to look at. It. 
This is the, uh, the son of the family riding off to tend to the herd. We spent the night sleeping in our yurts located on sloping ground, which contained two beds and a stove. The bathroom and showers were in a central facility, which made for a tough night because steps into the yurts were steep and the ladies had difficulty navigating. Meals were served in a dining facility. The following day, we journeyed to the Genghis Khan statue complex to see the 40 meter tall statue and enjoy the panoramic view from the top of the horse statue's head, which is entered by walking through its chest and neck. This is the entrance to the complex. They had a whole army stationed outside. Inside the complex, um, people could rent costumes and have their pictures taken, so we saw a lot of that. This was a wedding going on. Uh, if you need a site for a destination wedding, uh, give this uh, some consideration. And I think they throw these bridesmaids in uh, if you're interested. Uh, the statue of Genghis Khan is symbolically pointed eastward towards his birthplace. The complex is located on the bank of the Tool River, which according to legend, he found the Golden Whip. The attached museum has exhibitions relating to the Bronze Age and, and Zanu archaeological cultures in Mongolia, and an exhibition on the Great Khan period from the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, the next stop was the Zizan Memorial, which honored allied Mongolian and Soviet soldiers killed in World War II. So this is the memorial, and this is a close-up of some of the mural, mosaic murals inside. Uh, next was the Gangan Monastery, which is a Mongolian Buddhist monastery that's been restored and revitalized since 1990. The Tibetan, Tibetan name translates to the great place of complete joy. It currently has over 150 monks in residence. These folks are spinning prayer wheels and singing prayers. This is uh, the traffic in Ulan Vatur. They have modern cars and uh, was quite cosmopolitan. The next day we were deposited at the train station in the afternoon to begin our journey westward on the Trans-Mongolian Railroad. That trip was roughly 3,000 miles from Ulan Vatur to Moscow. My wife and I shared a compartment, but sleep was elusive as we crossed the border from Mongolia to Russia during the night and were visited by border officials from both countries who searched the compartment. This is the, the uh, train station at Ulan Bator. And this is uh, Mongolia as we were leaving. And we entered Russia, and this is what Siberia looks like. The train compartment contained nine compartments. The train car contained nine compartments, which could each accommodate four passengers and two bathrooms at the end of the car. We arrived in Irkutsk, a town in the mountainous Russian territory of Siberia the next afternoon. Trains in Russia run on Moscow time, 
which was five hours earlier than the local time in Irkutsk, which was confusing until it was explained to us. So this is Siberia. The train tracks ran along side villages, but in the distance, as we passed it, as you can see them as well. This is another train station. Lake Baikal is an ancient, massive lake in Siberia, located north of the Mongolian border. Considered the deepest lake in the world, it is circled by a network of hiking paths called the Great, the Great Baikal Trail. This is the lake. train station. Uh, the trains had ran pretty well to a schedule which was published in each car. And if you were brave, you could hop off and buy things to eat in the uh, shops along the station. This is the lake itself. This, I think, is their equivalent of a sightseeing boat. The village of Lestangia. This Bianca on its western shoreline is a popular starting point for summertime wildlife spotting tours, plus wintertime ice skating and dog sledding. Our first night was spent in the List Bianca village, a resort town on the Angara River in Siberia, which flowed out of Lake Baikal. Our day in List Listvianka village consisted of a village tour, taking a chairlift to a viewpoint for a panoramic picture, and visits to the wooden St. Nicholas Church and a local fish market. <clears throat> In the afternoon, we took a cruise on Lake Baikal and ended with a walk on the tracks on the first leg of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which is now only used twice a day for tourist trains. The next morning, we traveled to Talsi Village, an open-air museum of reconstructed wooden buildings which were relocated from low-lying areas where a dam was built on the Angara River. Irkutsk was founded as a wintering camp in 1652 during the first Russian colonization of the area. A fort was built in 1661, and Irkutsk rapidly became the main Russian trade route to China and Mongolia, acquiring town status in 1686. The city of Irkutsk, with attractive embankments along the river and many surviving wooden houses on its tree-lined streets, is an administrative and cultural center for eastern Siberia and of the Russian Far East. 
Its importance grew after the coming of the Trans-Siberian Railroad in 1898. Modern Irkutsk is one of the major industrial cities of Siberia and is especially noted for a wide range of engineering products. The next leg of the trip involved two nights on the train without meals. So the following morning, we stocked up with noodle dinners from a grocery store, which could be prepared by adding boiling water from a samovar located in the train car. We also had assorted culinary treasures which we had brought from home, such as candy, nuts, and dried fruit. That afternoon, we had a city tour, which included a number of churches, a World War II war memorial, and a synagogue. This is a war memorial. Every Russian city has a war memorial because during World War II, the Soviets lost at least 25 million people. Some sources say 40 million. And it's uh, had quite an impression on the population, although the population that remembers the war is, is rapidly disappearing. Lots of churches. Very colorful. <clears throat> This is the synagogue in Rakuts. I believe it's a Chabad synagogue. This is the inside. And this is the train station in Rakuts. The scenery we viewed from the train consisted of open fields, wooded areas, small villages of wooden buildings with gardens, cities with high-rise buildings, and trains going in the other direction. There was a woman that had, I think, three dogs, and every time the train stopped, she would get out uh, and walk them. Uh, this is one of the train stops where there were vendors selling things to eat while the train stopped. Two days later, we arrived in the Kachenburg, Siberia, in the Ur Ural Federal District of Russia, and were transported to our hotel. Uh, we didn't go to the formidable show. I probably missed something great, but we didn't go. The next day, we visited a memorial complex for the victims of political purges. Um, Stalin had at least 3 million people killed uh, due to his paranoia, either through execution or being exiled to the Gulag. Uh, we visited the Europe Asia Monument. Uh, apparently, that's a, a great place to get married. So this was one of the happy couples. And if they get married, you tie a colorful ribbon on this fence. <clears throat> uh, this is where the two continents meet. And I straddle two continents, Asia on the left and Europe on the right. And we visited the Ganina Yama Monastery Complex, which consisted of seven chapels, one for each member of the Romanov royal family. Um, Arlene had to dress appropriately, so they lent her this skirt.
The Russian Orthodox Church constructed the monastery in the year 2000 to mark the site <clears throat> where the last Romanov Emperor Nicholas II, his family, and members of his retinue were thrown into an abandoned iron mine shaft after their execution by a Bolshevik firing squad. The Bolsheviks felt that the royal family had to be eliminated to prevent their supporters from reinstalling them on the Russian throne at some future time. And it was an imminent threat of the city being occupied by the anti-communist whites. So in this complex, uh, this is a statue of Nicholas. This is the Tsarina Alexandria. These are the five children. The bodies were dumped in the mine shaft. This is the mine shaft, uh, which was actually behind this memorial. They were, the bodies were dumped in the mine shaft to prevent the development of a personality cult of the former imperial family. After rumors spread the next day in Kachenberg regarding the disposal site, the dismembered bodies were moved to another location, doused with sulfuric acid, burned with gasoline, and buried in two pits. The remains were discovered in 1979 and 2007 in two unmarked graves. DNA analysis confirmed the identity of the Romanov family members. Alas, Princess Anastasia did not survive. The remains of the five Romanovs discovered in 1979 were interred at the Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg in 1998. And in 2000, <clears throat> Nicholas II and his immediate family were canonized. The remains of the two Romanovs, a boy and a girl discovered in 2007, are considered relics by the Roman Orthodox Church and have not been interred. The next day, as we were leaving for the train, we stopped at the Church on Blood in Ekaterinburg, which was built on the site of the Apachev house belonging to a mining engineer in which the Roman North family was executed in the basement. The home which stood on the site was demolished in 1977, but the basement of the structure remained. Construction of the church was completed in 2003, with the basement from the original home becoming a part of the present structure. The church includes a room where Nicholas II and his family were executed, and its altar is located near the place of execution of the imperial family. There is also a museum with exhibits devoted to the last days of the Romanov family life. And these are just uh, the Kachenberg street scenes. Um, this, uh, whoops. This Russian 2018, um, we were there the year before, the, it referred to the World Cup games that were gonna be held the next year. The next leg of our train Odyssey was only a 12 hour journey to Kazan, Tartistan, a Republic in the Russian Federation, which is predominantly Muslim. The itinerary for the trip had us walking from the train station to the hotel, which was a few blocks away. But word got back to the tour company that we were too feeble to do that. So we were met by a bus outside the station complex. To get out of the train station involved walking up and down stairs to get over the train tracks. So we had to hire a porter to transport the suitcases to the bus. And the walk to the bus turned out to be almost as long as the walk to the hotel would have been. Getting in and out of train stations with, with our luggage was one of the biggest problems on the trip.
Um, you'll notice that most of the uh, villages we passed, the houses had greenhouses to grow vegetables and um, gardens for vegetables. Um, they had to make the most of the nice weather during the summer because in Siberia in the winter, it gets very cold. Okay, so the next stop is Kazan. It started with the city tour, including the old Tara Quarter, Caban Lakes, Millennium Park, and Freedom Square. During lunch, we had a cooking masterclass, and in the afternoon, we visited the Kazan Kremlin. This is the synagogue in Kazan. Um, I think this was the Chabad as well. Okay, this is the Kazan Kremlin. Kremlin actually means fortress, uh, which was the original site of the city. <clears throat> and this Kremlin contained the, the Qual of Sharif Mosque the leaning Sayempika Tower, the Annunciation Cathedral, and the Governor's Palace. We finished the day on our own, walking along Bamana Street, which contained many restaurants and stores similar to any city in the US. They even have McDonald's. Day two, <clears throat> we traveled to the Rafa Monastery, stopping at the temple of all religions en route. Uh, the guy that built this uh, put a synagogue, a mosque, and a church inside this building. Uh, he didn't quite finish it before he died, so his family is still collecting money to finish the job. And we continued on to the island of Vyansk, where we toured three monasteries. And the day ended with delivery to the train station for our overnight trip to Moscow, the capital of Russia. We were met at the train station early the next morning and delivered to our hotel for breakfast. Sightseeing began with a walk to the Alexander Garden on the way to the Kremlin Wall and Red Square.
On the outside of the Kremlin wall, the cremated remains of many prominent Russians and Soviets are buried in the wall and in graves in front of the wall. Um, these are the only five people planted in the wall. There's 106 uh, grave sites in this uh, necropolis, but only five made it into the wall. That's uh, Stalin on the left. Lenin's mausoleum is also in front of the Kremlin wall on the west side of Red Square, which also contains St. Basil's Cathedral, the State Historical Museum, and the gum store. This is outside the Kremlin wall. Um, this is where Lenin's mausoleum is. And when um, the leaders of the Soviet Union and now of Russia addressed people in Red Square, they would be standing on top here. Well, we actually went to visit Lenin inside. Um, we, there was a, a queue and you get ushered past him in a hurry. But it looks like the boys uh, from the Wax Museum are doing a good job keeping them going. You don't know how much is really Lenin and how much is uh, Madame Tussauds uh, restorers. Okay, this is the gum store, which uh, is now <clears throat> features many boutiques. I was in uh, in Moscow in 1991. This place uh, was deserted. There was no merchandise, no people, because this was before the Soviet Union disintegrated and nobody had any money. Uh, but now it's quite changed, uh, filled with uh, Chinese. It used to be Japanese, now it's Chinese. But it's quite a different uh, perspective from my earlier trip. This is the famous St. Basil's Cathedral with the onion domes. The center of Red Square was set up for a band concert between army bands. So we weren't able to actually walk through the center of the square. We could only walk around the periphery. The highlights of a visit to Red Square were viewing the eight side churches in St. Basil's Cathedral and filing past Lenin's embalmed body in his mausoleum. The center of Red Square was barricaded and tents <clears throat> were set up for a military band concert later that day, which prevented us from getting good pictures of the square. The Duma, I think, was the legislature at one time. In the afternoon, we went inside the Kremlin walls and visited the armory chamber containing a dazzling array of treasures from the 4th to the 20th century, including thrones and carriages of the Tsars the works of Moscow silver and, and goldsmiths, arms, jewels, precious jewel encrusted Fabergé Easter eggs, and other Russian and foreign decorative arts. We also viewed five palaces, including the Grand Kremlin Palace, which is the official residence of the president of the Russian Federation, i.e. Putin, four cathedrals, and many towers along the wall surrounding the Kremlin. Other highlights were the Ivan the Great Bell Tower, the Tsar Cannon, and the Tsar Bell.
is the armory and museum. Senate. Okay, we're done with the Kremlin. This is just some street scenes. <clears throat> My wife wanted to see a folk show that evening, so our guide got us tickets for the Russian National Dance Show and arranged for an Uber car to take us there. Arlene arranged with the Uber driver to pick us up after the show at a specific time. We had to leave the show early to be on time, but the driver never showed up. After waiting on the street for about 15 minutes, Arlene spotted someone with a cell phone who fortunately spoke English and had him arrange an Uber ride for us back to the hotel, which were arrived within minutes. So fortunately, Arlene was there to guide me. I didn't uh, suffer too much. On our last day of sightseeing, we visited the Tretyakov Gallery, which contained Russian art from the 11th to the 20th century and had a guided tour conducted by our Moscow guide. After lunch, we visited the Moscow subway. This is the subway entrance. That M is not McDonald's. I guess it stands for the Russian equivalent of Metro. And this is a subway car. Uh, so our guide took us on the subway. We got an explanation of the system and took a short ride on several of its lines. Each subway station was a work of art with many murals and sculptures. Uh, this is a, a corridor and entrance to the platforms were through these columns, escalators. Uh, Moscow subway system served as bomb shelter because it's so far below ground. And you can see some of the art on the ceiling. And this uh, displayed on the walls. Lots of this. During the morning art tour, discovered, Arlene discovered that the gallery had a collection of contemporary art at a different location. So she got subway directions from our guide and we took off on our own after the rest of the group returned to the hotel. She was able to navigate our way in the subway because enough people understood English and we didn't get lost. Any trip on which I don't get lost, I regard as a success. The only downside was that on the way back to the hotel, we ran into a heavy downpour and got soaked. We arranged to meet my sister and brother-in-law at the hotel to go out to dinner, but the ladies wound up going to a grocery store and getting sandwiches. Fortunately, all our cell clothing dried by the next morning and we were able to pack for our return trip home, although my sneakers needed the help of the hotel's blow dryer. So these are all Moscow city scenes. This is quite a change from my 1991 visit where everything seemed to be very drab and, and all Soviet era architecture and depressing. All right, that's it. 
Did you uh, experience any probka in Russia? Any what? Probka. Probka mean, or vodka? No, no, probka. It means a cork, but it, it's the word they use for traffic. Oh, traffic. Um, no, not really. No. Um, if any, I know that there are questions that have already come up in I the just, Can chat. I say a couple of things, Rabbi, about this? Only trip? if Steve lets, Arlene. Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, I don't have much choice. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, did you? I don't know if you told them about the conditions on the train. I mean, the train was absolutely clean. The reason we went on this trip was we're founders of MIM. And I had seen a, a Mongolian exhibit. I said, I want to go there. So anyway, being in the travel business, in addition to decorating, we went. There were no showers on the train. Every two days, we hopped off and went to a hotel to take shower and whatever. The trains were very clean, and it's an expensive trip, but there were no, there were no showers. Number two, we had been to St. Petersburg to see the art collection in the Her uh, Hermitage, and I was very upset because they don't have anything to protect the art items. Moscow was a completely different story. Everything was perfect. Everything was prime condition. The food was excellent. Somebody asked about kosher food. We're not, I'm not kosher. We're not kosher. So we didn't look for it. I don't know the answer. But the food was excellent. Um, and the place was clean. The Kremlin was a surprise to me because I thought the Kremlin was a big fortress. It's a bunch of churches, basically. There are a few government buildings, but that's it. So I just wanted to make those little comments after having been all over Russia, over a lot of it. Thank you. Um, and I could answer about the kosher food because I was also in Moscow. I don't know about all the other cities, but in Moscow, you can definitely get kosher food. And I think any city with a Chabad presence, there's got to be an opportunity to have kosher food. Right. Right. Some of the shoals, like in Moscow, the Marina Russia Shoal has a restaurant. Uh -huh. But either way, those are uh, those are small questions. Any, um, if you do have a question, please do chime in. I know that I saw earlier. Uh, I see some chat. stuff in the chat. Uh, yeah. Avi wants to know whether people live there by by choice or by force. Yes, that was asked around the uh, Irkuts. Um... Okay. Well, I think people have a choice. Um, if you if you are born somewhere, spend your whole life there, and you don't know any better, you stay. Um, things are certainly a lot better than when it was part of the Soviet Union. And then I, another question was asked, what time of the year was the trip taken? It was in, in August. August. And this but, is- so The weather was quite pleasant in Siberia. In the winter, it really gets cold. And uh, one of the guides told that, I mean, the food there was good. Uh, we had a choice of, of food that we're used to. But in the winter, people eat a lot of fatty food because they need that fat to stay alive. It gets so uh, cold. Wow, interesting. So, but you didn't try the milk? I don't try milk anywhere. I yeah. did. I drank. I drank. Arlene is here to tell the story, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I drank. What's the reason? Wait, do you not drink because not pasteurized? Is that the reason? Who, me? I have, I'm yeah. lactose intolerant. Oh, okay, okay. So but, am I, but I drink it anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the temperature? This is a question in the, uh, what were the temperatures, even though it was August, let's say when you're talking about the Siberia part of it, um, how 50, cold? 50 to 70, something like that. I wouldn't go swimming, but it was, it was, it was fine. But getting back to the milk thing, I didn't show a picture of this uh, when we were being entertained in the nomads uh, earth. Um, it was the, the mass milk was is stored in a, a big bladder, an animal's bladder. And every time the woman needed some, she'd go there with a dipper and dip it out to use for cooking or, or whatever. Wow, straight from the source. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, let me let, give you a little little thing. When we got to uh, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, Louis Vuitton had just left two weeks before. So that's how modern 
uh, Mongolia was. I didn't expect that at all. I mean, they had gone out of business because they didn't have enough business, but it was so modern like any other city. I was shocked. I expected it to be very rural like what we saw. Yeah, it's one of our rituals of travel. No matter where we go, we have to check out Louis Vuitton. Because it's always cheaper in another country. My wife corrupted my sister tonight. They go together. <laughs> now, you said you went on this trip with your brother? My sister and brother-in-law and two other ladies that are on the cruise. Really? So there were six yeah. of us in our, uh, in our party, which made the experience on the train sort of OK. Uh, being cooped up for all that, all those hours in just one compartment would have really been miserable. Um, and some of the compartments had four people in it. We each had two people per compartment, which was okay. And how long were the stretches on the train itself from two, city to city? Two, two days about. Wow. Well, from, from train stop to train stop. Um, hours, hours on end. So I would spend it standing at the window looking for things to take pictures of, most of which got blurred because the train was moving, but it gave me something to do. And well, we got off every two days. We didn't get off every day. And you said no showers? No, no showers. showers. <laughs> right. But the toilets were immaculate. They cleaned them all day long. And we brought our own food. We brought a lot of our own food too because we didn't know what they'd give us to eat. So the train had a service, had a food service? Yes, yes. They did. And some uh, of the meals they provided. E each car had a, a conductress, a woman, who took care of keeping water in the samovar and cleaning the uh, bathrooms, uh, none of whom spoke English, but somehow we got along OK. Uh, very nice. Anyone have any questions specifically about this? I do know that Steve is preparing a another presentation for February. Um, I don't know if you if you shared yet what trip that is, Steve. I'm keeping it a secret, but I will disclose it. It's going to be on a trip Arlene and I took to Africa, uh, where we did a lot of uh, big game safaris with a camera, as well as other experiences. That should be quite fascinating. Steve, I think somebody has a question about the bathrooms or something. I don't know. I think. Uh, where were the restrooms located? That was in the chat. At, at the end of each car, there were two um, restrooms. And how many, um, so how many cabins were in a car? Nine, nine compartments in each car. The train had, I don't know, maybe a dozen cars. And people would get on and off at various stops. Um, we, I don't know how many people actually made the trip from Ulan Bator to Moscow as we did. Well, actually, Steve, the trip goes all the way to China. It goes from Mongolia, it goes all the yeah, way. I said that at the beginning. You can right, start right. actually in Vladivostok, Russia, which goes through China and then goes into Mongolia. But you guys did, so other people are using this because they need to get places. You did Correct. it as a, as a yes. tour. Correct. So this is their main method of transport, if not using flights. I guess, yeah. All right, Steve, is, Steve in your slide, num I think it was slide number 16. I believe those are muskoxes, and they're raised on an island between Alaska and um, Russia. And you're not allowed any of the fiber. The fiber is very prized, very difficult to get. Obviously, you wouldn't want to go up and pluck it off of that animal. So you pick it up off the ground when they molt their... Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I did I did copious research and couldn't find out what it was, so I gave up. But yeah, that sounds right, muskox. Any other questions? This was a lot of uh, really good information and great pictures. So this was on a digital camera, correct? Yeah, right. Well, speaking of, of my pictures, um, the next time I do this, um, the cap, your uh, subtitles, I couldn't see where I was, which is a little confusing because I covered it up. Oh. I covered up. The All right, we'll do it on the top then. Okay. Okay. Too I well. wanted to, uh, I understand what you're saying. For, uh, we'll talk about that off the uh, ear. Yeah. I say off ear. I finally bought a sign for my office that says on ear. So. 
Okay. Uh, but again, I want to thank you, Steve, for this presentation. And if anyone does have any questions, of course, um, and I have some, I have a question in the chat I'll read in a second. But if you do have questions that you thought of later, I know that Arlene and Steve would both be happy to answer questions about the different trips, uh, maybe because you're thinking about it or not. So here are some questions from the chat. Um, what was this like a steam powered engine train or do you know anything about the engines that pull those trains? Um, oh, oh, they were electric, electric powered. Yeah. Um, some of the slides showed the overhead um, wires. Oh, interesting. And then Lori asked if the churches that you showed, are they actually in use? Yeah. Um, we didn't go into very many, but yes, um, religion has made a reoccurrence in Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union. So they're the getting synagogues are in use as well. Right. All right. Well, thank you. All right. So I'm going to thank you officially. If there are any questions after this, definitely please do ask. Uh, but again, for those of you who are looking forward to tomorrow's movie discussion group, and again, I want to reiterate it's not just an open discussion there's an actual presentation which you can learn a lot about the movie and its history so even if you haven't watched the movie it still might be of interest to you that's tomorrow but that is at 11 a.m not 12 30. and again thank you steve for this this was okay. like a lot of effort put into and a lot of information thank you so thank you all for joining today